You know, we give money away and use money for all kinds of reasons. Most of us here have to pay a mortgage or rent, right? For some reason, we have to shell out every month to, to live where we live. And that, that kind of giving is sort of a contractual giving. We have a rental contract or a mortgage contract, several pages of a mortgage contract. And that's a contractual kind of thing that we totally understand. But then uh, I think most of us probably go to the grocery store, some of us maybe more than once a week, and uh, we buy food that we enjoy and need. That is a, a different kind of giving, isn't it? That's a, a consumer. We're a consumer. We have to go purchase things and consume them. Uh, most of us here have children, grown or young children or grandchildren. And, you know, parents, and we pretend to give to our children, don't we? We give them something uh, for all kinds of different reasons. But the reason we're willing to really to give to them is because there's a close connection. I mean, we're connected. We're a family. So we're connected to them, and we're willing to sort of freely share stuff from, from us with other people that are in family. It's quite different than if you walk out of a Walmart or go somewhere, and there's a beggar on the street. Now, that's or come to an intersection or something. Then you really just have a, you feel like you have a totally free choice. Well, I can either give or ignore, right? And uh, you make your choice, and you go on about that. You don't feel there's an actual tangible return for yourself, you decide, okay, I'm going to help this person out. And then sometimes there are, there are needs or causes out there that we, are, we, we, uh, we really feel about, but we know they're just so overwhelming that just we, we, can't, we can't do supply the need. I think of things like the Orlando Rescue Mission or the Neighborhood Center in Deland to help with the homeless. Uh, I tell you, one homeless person is more than any individual of us can handle in terms of the needs that they have. And you need an organization like these to help deal with those things. And so if you have a concern and you want to help, you can channel your charitable giving to these kinds of uh, non-governmental organizations and nonprofits to try to help with certain kinds of things. So we all, I'm guessing, we all uh, do charitable giving in some way, in, in that way. And you know what happens if you give to one of these organizations? You get mail. <laughs> They'll even send you coins in, your, in the, the mail, right? I just sort of have a joke. Of, said if we could save the U.S. Postal Service, if everyone just give a couple of bucks every two or three months, and our mailboxes will be constantly full uh, from here to eternity, and the mail service shouldn't have any problem with that. Uh, the, and, of course, what about our church giving? Oh, that's sort of a different category, isn't it? Because if you think about it, our church giving almost covers all of those categories. There's consumer elements to our church experience, aren't there? I mean, we, 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 we come and want a worship service, and we know it takes a place, and you've got to have staff and different kinds of things, and a cost associated with that. So there's a sense in which church has a consumer dimension to it, something that we believe in. We believe it helps people. Um, we feel a connection. There may not be family, but when you come regularly, you feel you're a part of a, of a community and you have a sense of ownership and connectedness. Um, but also, sort of like the mortgage or the rental agreement, uh, I think for all, all, many of us, if not most of us, there is also something of a contractual dimension, isn't there? Okay, now God, you've done this for me. Uh, I'm going to do this for you, right? There is sort of a contract dimension to our giving uh, to God. When it comes to our faith in our relationship with God, our giving is all about vision. It's all about vision. The very heart of giving is vision. Our vision provides the why. It provides the motivation. It supplies the energy. And it also gives us the focus where are we going to channel our limited resources? And the size of our vision is what guides the amount of our giving. The size of our vision is what guides the amount of our giving within the context of whatever our individual financial means may be, right? We're all in different financial situations. That's not the thing. The thing is the size of the vision guides what we decide to use with what is ours. 
In our scripture passage today, the Apostle Paul illustrates in a very good way how vision motivates giving. Paul is collecting money for the church in Jerusalem. Very early on, the church in Jerusalem went through some very difficult uh, problems because uh, as more uh, people, mostly Jews in Jerusalem, were following Jesus Christ, it caused problems there, in the, in, and they became a bit more ostracized. And we don't know many details, but they probably went through some financial hardships. And Paul wanted to help the Jerusalem church. He probably thought of it as the mother church. He never uses that term, but I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't think in those kinds of terms. But he had another reason besides just that need. Okay, we've got to supply that need. Uh, when Paul writes this uh, letter in 2 Corinthians, uh, this is after the council in Jerusalem has already met and over the issue of Gentiles and Jewish Jesus believers, right? And uh, they came to their agreement there. But as Paul's churches through Turkey and Macedonia and Greece, etc., were mainly Gentiles, there had some Jews, but there were mainly Gentiles. So Paul wanted this offering to be an expression of the solidarity and the oneness in Jesus Christ between the Gentiles and the Jews within the church. He was making a point, okay, beyond just supplying the need. So he's promoting this in these churches, and I mean, it sort of boggles my mind, because these churches had barely existed a few months. <laughs> a few months, I would imagine. And he's appealing to them to, to participate in this collection for Jerusalem. Now, the churches in Macedonia he's, he's praising here and using as an example to inspire the Corinthians to get on the ball with their part of the collection. Uh, or the church in Philippi, remember that, he had the vision in Troas, he goes, takes the boat over, and uh, Lydia, the purple seller, who was a prosperous businesswoman, is converted. And then, after Paul and Silas are thrown in prison and, and an angel rescues them, the, the jailer, the head jailer in all his household, are, uh, become believers. So you have a mixture of there, and I suppose uh, there were some financial difficulties in that church as well. So you have Philippi, and then he goes to Thessalonica, and then to Berea. Those three places are the churches he's mentioned, talking about when he says Macedonia. And he praises their generosity. Listen to this in verse 2. During a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. He puts together some things here that we don't associate together. We don't put affliction and joy <laughs> together. We don't associate, no. Uh, during severe affliction, their abundant joy. What? They're joyful in the midst of affliction? And then he says, their extreme poverty has overflowed in a wealth of generosity. Whoa! Extreme poverty, wealth, a generosity? How in the world can you combine those things for a group of people and say that of them? Uh, these people had suffered for their faith. They were suffering for their faith, and they had economic repercussions for it, and yet, and yet, they were willing to participate and gather money to send to Jerusalem, all which is so far away. It's incredible. Now listen to verse 4. Begging us, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. Hmm. Affliction and joy, poverty and generosity, and they're begging us for the privilege of sharing in this. I don't know about you, but that's not what I associate with my experiences going around asking for help, okay? Uh, it's just really something else. But when you think about this and what Paul is saying and the, the example here, you realize that there is a vision behind that giving. Wouldn't it be good to know what kind of vision that can combine affliction and joy and poverty and generosity? Paul tells us in verse 5, they gave themselves first to the Lord and by the will of God to us. They gave themselves to the Lord. This is the key vision that drives their giving. They are so grateful for the new life in Jesus Christ. They, these guys have only accepted Christ not that long ago. They received the gift of the Spirit, and these weren't just accepting ideas. Okay, you come along with a new idea. I accept your idea. 
and I sign on, now I'm a Christian. No, 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 no. This is experientially based. You don't give out of an idea, you give out of an experience, right? They had experience of God, and this gratitude for the new life of Christ is already growing into a love for Christ and for God's people. So they're grateful for the past work, you know, what, ha what Jesus has done, but their gratitude is also based on what God is doing in their lives moment by moment, day to day. It isn't just something from the past. It's something, an ongoing experience of life in God that they're experiencing. And that's where their gratitude, that's what energizes and fuels their gratitude. And their giving, and this is so important, their giving isn't just focused on the need. They're not responding to the collection just because, oh, there's some people that are suffering in Jerusalem. They're giving, they see their giving as an extension of their connection with Jesus Christ. Isn't that clear? They see their giving as an extension of their connection and relationship with Jesus Christ. They are not giving to perform for God. They're not giving so that God will watch and say, ah, oh, you did the right thing, I'm going to bless you, you know? Or to be in good graces, I'm going to give so God will think better of me and maybe pour out more blessings. They're not performing. Their giving is not performative. They're not putting on a show for anybody. They are giving out of participation. We are participating in the life of God. We are participating in the people of God and God's work. Their giving is not performative. It's participatory. I think that's a good question we can ask ourselves. Hmm. I'm not saying one is good and one is bad, but I think both elements probably are involved in us, I think in me as well. To what degree is my giving performative? Am I trying to sort of show God something, you know? I'm wanting to, to have him hold up a 10 instead of a 3 uh, at, the, at the judging time or something like that. To what degree is my giving performative, and to what degree is it participation? Am I participating in what God is doing in my life and what God wants to do through me and with others in God's kingdom and in this world? Is our giving performance or is it participation? And we've got to ask ourselves the same question. He said, have we given ourselves first to the Lord? What does that mean to you? I would love to go around and interview each of us and have us hear one another's responses. What does it mean to give yourself first to to the Lord. Well, one thing is it certainly is, is our giving an extension of that relationship. You see how Paul is tying those together? They gave themselves first to the Lord as the motivation for their giving. This kind is not tied to this kind of giving is not tied to consumptions or to needs or to paying for services. It's totally relation relationship based. How relationship based is our giving? And then Paul says, and they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God, to us. Why did they give to Paul? Why did they want to give to him? Well, for heaven's sakes, he's the one who brought them the gospel of Jesus Christ. They never even knew he existed before Paul showed up. And God brought him along their paths, and they heard the gospel, and the Spirit had touched their hearts, and they were soundly converted. They received the gift of the Spirit, and they started a whole new life. They had a whole new life with the living God. They were no longer just going through rituals in various temples, different idols and other kinds of things. So they were grateful that Paul brought the gospel, and so they could certainly see the benefit it would be that other people could hear the gospel and know what I've experienced and what I am experiencing. Other people can know that. So they gave themselves to us because they realized, what did Paul do right after they put their faith in Jesus Christ. What did he do? He baptized them. <laughs> he baptized them. The Philippian jailer that night, him and his household, they baptized them. Why? Because that is our way of showing your incorporation into the body of Christ. You're, you're made a part of the people of God in Jesus Christ. You're made a citizen of heaven. That's why he baptized them. So now they realize, wait a minute, we are a part of a people. We are part of a kingdom we have a new Lord, and we belong to one another. We're like family. We are like family, that close connection. So that creates 
when you get a familial connection, that kind of closeness, you're a lot more open of sharing with what you have with someone else, aren't you? Because we're connected, we share God's work through others. Paul's doing things that they couldn't do. They were doing some things and going places Paul couldn't go. So they saw their giving as a way of sharing in what God's doing through other people. And that's what we're doing as we share and as we give. The heart of giving is vision. Our vision is what gives us the why. It gives us the motivation. It's the energy. And it's also the focus for our giving. Community United Methodist Church has a vision. We are a vibrant family of God living the love of Jesus with our neighbors. We're a part of this community. And together we are peacemakers. We bring people together, practicing compassion and the love of Jesus Christ as we dive into Scripture and make disciples or followers of Jesus Christ. Does that vision line up with your vision of your journey with God? You're on your journey with Christ down the road. Does the vision of this body line up and resonate with your vision? Let's go back to the passage for a moment because Paul wants to add another layer of depth to the vision behind our giving. <clears throat> In verse 9, he says, You know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's using Jesus as an example. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. When Paul talks about Jesus being rich, he's talking about not his, uh, his time on this earth as Jesus of Nazareth. He's talking about he's the preexistent son of God, okay? He's the co-eternal son of God. He was involved in creation and all of that. And as, 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 as Jesus is, is in his divinity, it's the creator, the source of all that exists in all reality. I mean, the term wealth doesn't even apply because it's just so overwhelming. When you're the source of it all, I mean... Talking about an amount is sort of ridiculous. It's almost as if all of a sudden, <clears throat> all of a sudden uh, you had Elon Musk's wealth tomorrow. It would be so overwhelming you would be dizzy and be totally confused and not have a clue what to do. And even if you went out on a wild spending spree, you wouldn't even have used a half of a drop of <laughs> what's in the bucket, right? I mean, that's the kind of wealth. I mean, that's not even, that's a drop. Elon Musk's wealth is is not even a drop in the bucket for God, obviously, when you take all of reality. So this is the riches Paul is talking about that Christ has. But then what does he do? Becomes incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth, becomes a fully human being, has to deal with life just like you and I have to deal with life. And, and, and he became poor. He didn't, and he could have come as the most powerful and the most wealthy human being that ever existed in human history. But he didn't do that. He came in a humble family. His dad was a carpenter. He owned his own business. He wasn't a super prosperous one, far as we know, but he was just a young businessman, an artisan, knew how to do stuff. And he probably had a property developer he had to work with, said. <laughs> so then he talked about his poor, but it's what Jesus did with his life and his giving, his sacrificial way of life for us, which ended up, of course, in the cross. So that's, that's the poverty Paul is talking about. But... Through his life and death and resurrection, that's how he opened the way for us to be reconciled with God, for our, for our humanity to be restored, for us to be heirs and, and inherit the promises of God. It's just incredible, incredible wonders. Riches beyond, and it's not about money, it's about the riches of life itself with God. The Apostle Paul puts this in a more artistic way, uh, in, it's the hymn in Philippians chapter 2, and I just want to read a piece of that hymn. Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, or Christ, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. That is, Jesus didn't take his divinity when he was a human being and, 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 and play games with it and, and somehow uh, go against his humanity. He stayed fully human. He operated in the power of the Spirit as you and I may operate in the power of the Spirit. But he emptied himself emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being in, born in human likeness. This doesn't mean he just appeared 
like some magic trick or some ghost or something. It's a human. He's fully, totally, fully human. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to God to the point of death, even death on a cross. He went to the point, he gave himself to the ultimate extreme that any human being can give, which is their own life. And he suffered that death in an ignominious, shameful way in his day and time. Why did he give himself? Why did he become poor? What was the driving vision for that self-giving? For God so loved (laughs) that he gave. We're going to talk about that more next week. For God so loved that he gave. Jesus Jesus Christ shared the vision of the fulfillment of God's creative vision and purpose for humanity and for creation and was participating in that vision who for the joy that set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, as it says in Hebrews 12. When it comes to our faith, our relationship with God, vision, our giving is all about vision. The heart of our giving is vision. Our vision is what provides the why, the motivation, it provides the energy and the focus for our vision. And the size of our vision, the greatness of our vision, guides the amount of our giving. The size of Jesus' vision (laughs) is what enabled him to give everything and hold nothing back. What is the vision driving your giving? That's the question I want you to take home with you today. That's the one I want you to wrestle with and pray over and come to a peace with God about. I don't want any guilt trips. I just want an honest answer for each of us. What is the vision that drives my giving? Is it consumerism? (laughs) Am I paying for services received? That's a good first step. It's certainly something we've got to have. We've got to have. Or is it an expression of a discipleship? If you're following Jesus Christ, is it an expression of your relationship with God. The Apostle Paul shows us in this passage that giving is not a performance for God, it is a participation in the life of God. Paul shows us that our giving is an extension of our relationship with God, but also with one another. We are baptized into the body of Christ. We are a part of God's mission in this world. And gratitude, gratitude, when you're grateful for something, naturally flows into generosity, doesn't it? Generous people are grateful people, and grateful people are generous people. When we have an attitude of gratitude, we have an openness and a charitableness about us and a freeness to share our time and our resources or whatever with others. So as each of us prays about our giving for the coming year, let's bring to mind God's overwhelming grace in Jesus Christ. Not just the grace displayed 2,000 years ago, but the grace that God gives every moment of every day in our lives as we share life with God and God shares life with us. And let our giving, let's tie our giving to our shared vision of God's kingdom. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, thank you for your word today. Thank you for showing us the key to giving into the vision, to the great gratitude for your grace displayed in our lives in so many different ways. God, as each of us wrestles with this question, just pray that you would bring us to a place where we feel where our vision matches your vision. (laughs) And show us how we can give with our lives in ways to advance your kingdom. Thank you for what, thank you for your giving to us so constantly by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.